After more than 50 years of political independence and various approaches to development, agriculture remains the most important economic activity in Ghana and in the majority of African countries. In the case of Ghana, even though agriculture's contribution to GDP has declined continuously over the decades, falling to 18% in 2018, the sector continues to employ more than 30% of working persons. Agriculture remains the single largest employer and the livelihoods of many Ghanaians are directly or indirectly linked to the sector. Professor <laughs> Uh, we Agriculture is important because that is our main and traditional work here. Sinkapa <laughs> Now you can cashin kafa ma ka to to chempa kama pala pih ni pih yo. The reason why I decided to farm yams. Yam farm has a lot of help in a farmer. Because if you are a yam farmer in your house day in day out you take yam you eat fufu every day until you planted everything and finish. Even if you planted and finish you can still get yams reserved for Eating. In order to arrive at a deeper understanding of the key issues facing commercial farmers in Ghana, while taking note of the changes in the global environment at large, a group of researchers from the University of Ghana have in the past six years been carefully researching four districts in four regions of Ghana. The study districts, namely Garu Tampani in the Upper East region. Gonja East in the Savannah region, Esunafu North in the Ahafo region, and Kwaibibrim in the Eastern region. The spread of districts and research participants, the long-term engagement in the field, and the research questions have given researchers a deeper and broader understanding of the state of agriculture, how the sector has changed over the years, its potentials, the effects of agricultural sector policies on farmers, the challenges facing commercial farmers in general, and women farmers in particular, and what measures farmers recommend for strengthening agriculture and its contribution to decent employment and to Ghana's economic development. The main features I would distinguish um, the features by um, 
geography and if i say geography basically whether or not the farmer lives in, in the northern uh, study areas or in the south so in in the north uh, the main feature there is uh, a focus more on uh, crops that are also food uh, meant for food so you have yam which can be consumed uh, as well as sold you have rice you have um, vegetables like onions in some areas um, so that's for the north when you come to the south the main emphasis tends to be on non-food cash crops it's not that they don't produce any food crops for sale of course plantain is important in some of the areas but the main emphasis i mean if you ask a farmer what makes you a commercial farmer uh, the main thing is uh, likely to mention to you is uh, because it's producing cocoa or oil palm or cashew or maybe some citrus depending on the area you go agricultural commercialization is not a new phenomenon in Ghana, a country that has had a long historical trajectory of commercial agriculture. However, the current interest in commercialization provides an opportunity to examine the differences among farmers in their experiences of commercialization and its contribution to their livelihood outcomes and well-being. Studies have pointed to differences in the experiences of farmers in southern Ghana as compared with their counterparts in the north and between male and female farmers and smallholder and medium-scale farmers across the country. In northern Ghana, agricultural commercialization has focused on the production of food crops, while the south is generally noted for export-oriented crops such as cocoa, cashew, and oil palm. The choices of these crops are not only influenced by climatic conditions, but also have been influenced by history and socioeconomic conditions. In both Northern and Southern Ghana, commercialization is not only increasing, but changing. One key feature of this change is the addition of a new stream of crops and the increased production of crops which were originally produced for household consumption. The demand for these new crops is thus increasing the interaction between farmers and markets, even if production is carried out on a small scale. These developments, which have complex interactions with land, labor and capital, are highly gendered. The more commercialized a farmer is, it means that he is selling most of the food crops that he produces or the largest proportion of the food that they produce. So it means basically also that once a farmer decides which crop to produce, it's also made a commercialization decision. If you decide to produce cocoa, it means that you are a commercial farmer. If you decide to produce cashew, you are a commercial farmer because you can't eat you know, all your cashew or you can't eat your cocoa at home. Commercialization provides an opportunity for farmers to make money and you sell, you make money, and then you can purchase what you cannot produce yourself. So in that sense, commercialization is a very important uh, means of uh, making a living because they raise money. They can invest in their children's education. Uh, we, one thing we noticed, uh, especially in the cocoa areas, is that people sell their cocoa and they build new houses or they change their roofs or they convert their mud houses to brick or block houses. So these are all, you know, from proceeds of, of commercialization, right? So commercialization is, is extremely important for these smallholders uh, when it comes to their livelihoods. In the last 30 years that I can quite remember how I grew, people did only one to five acres for the upkeep of their families. Today, because of the emergence of the agri value chains on crops, others are grabbing land that are exceeding 10 to 20 acres be owned by one person and incorporating machinery, equipment like um, tractors, combined harvesters, and what have you. These are basically associated with commercial agriculture. So I want to say commercial agriculture is being practiced 
though it's at a slow pace. But who knows? In the next two to three years, it's possible that one farmer can buy at least the whole land of Garu up to 200 or 300 hectares. It's still possible because of the interest that is coming up. So commercial agriculture is creeping in slowly. We travel to the Bal Mihunse Koko. I work on a staple crop in Tino. We imagine some of the baby deer, Koko Nubipa, and to be bad pens eighty years in the Maya Koko. Koko bear forty acres. Ah, a man for whom they say, my full man and my feebay. We are something we call staff loan. They will give you, ask you to go and take the loan for three months. And then I'll go and take the three months salary advance. Then I'll plow that wine into my family. And before you realize, an articulator is sitting in my house to convey my corn at the end of the year. And when I go and sell that in bulk, my brother, the money is huge. Yeah. So when the money is huge, what do I do with it? And I make sure that we had all plantable things, things that you don't need to go and buy them in the market. Like I'm talking to you, we plant pepper, we plant okra, and we make sure that all the dry season, we have a vegetable garden, and then we don't buy all those things. We go into onions cultivation, we don't buy those things. There are things that are going to pick your small, small runners away. And then I am in livestock, in, in poultry, I don't buy meat. If I open my fridge now, you see the fridge is full. It's just here. The fridge is full of meat. Slaughter, sometimes even a cow. And we are sitting there eating. So we don't spend on the salary. The new paradigm of smallholder agriculture, which is also tied to this agroa scheme, is that new crops are becoming commercialized, especially food crops. Cassava is the best example. Today, cassava is used for beer. Medium-skill farmers are especially interesting because they are often Ghanaians who have been working in other sectors of the economy over a long period of time and have accumulated resources from those sectors and they have plowed it into agriculture. And they, they basically show what possibilities there are for small-scale farmers if they get the needed support. It suggests that if small-scale farmers um, get improved access to land and they get support with inputs and credit and other facilities, they are likely to move into medium-scale farming and that will be very good for um, the agricultural uh, landscape. And it is imperative that if we decide to put in place policies to support the growth of medium farmers, that we ensure that women are also supported to become medium farmers. Because one of the unfortunate observations we have made in the agricultural sphere is that when households move from small-scale farming to medium-scale farming, and they begin to use um, hard labor, women have get out of farming because they are not able to get the land to farm um, for, on, uh, on such a scale. So they move out into other economic activities. If we want more women to remain in farming, we have to support them in, in, in ways that ensure that they remain in, in, in agriculture. In spite of the many challenges of the sector, agricultural commercialization is viewed favorably because it is seen as capable of providing solutions to the problems of poverty and food insecurity. However, commercialization is a very complex process and its outcomes depend on existing conditions as well as how well a farmer can meet the demands that it imposes. These conditions include access to land in terms of access, control over labor, costs of labor and wages, technologies, credit and other factors of production. Also important are the nature of household production systems and the burden of unpaid care work. Access to land is a particularly challenging issue for women in spite of the fact that many of them are involved in food production. You will find that women um, have fewer um, uh, tracts of land. They, 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 the size of land they have tends to be smaller than the size of land that, that men have for farming. 
you also find that in terms of labor arrangements, the social norms privilege the needs that men have because and the farms that men, men farm are considered to be family farms, whilst women's farms are considered to be their own business. Secondly, uh, women have um, less money to buy the important inputs that they need, like labor, like uh, agro, chemicals and so on. And then therefore that tends to affect their, their harvest. You also find that um, although women are very active in the distribution of food and this is um, an important source of income for them they do not get much support for the work that they do in food distribution and much of it is self-generated and and it relies on them borrowing, borrowing capital which which comes at a very high cost to go and buy food and so on so the earnings that should help their families do not um, do not materialize Commercialization has resulted in land shortages in many farming communities in Ghana. The severity of this problem varies from one district to another and always has important gender dimensions. One development which affects agriculture and which is one of the triggers for our study on commercial agriculture is the recent spate of large-scale land acquisitions which um, affected Ghana. This is actually a global issue and it was brought on by the recent food, energy and financial crisis across the globe. It was observed that as a result of this food, energy and financial crisis, there was a spate of large-scale land acquisitions across the globe, particularly in Africa and other areas of the global south. And this led to concerns about a development that we've experienced in Ghana over a long period of time, which is the increasing dispossession of small-scale farmers, but also processes of large of land concentration, whereby people have very large tracts of land that they do not actually use, but have acquired, and also and the increasing fragmentation of smallholder plots. So many people who want to now start farming cannot find fresh land on which um, to farm because those lands are not available. And yet there are large tracts of land which um, are owned by privately and therefore have been enclosed and so are not free to be used for farming. So that's a, a particularly negative um, development in the agricultural sector. And one of the results of this has been to create a lot of tenure insecurity, but also high prices of rented land and also the entrenchment of tenancy arrangements that do not favor farmers because farmers are having to pay as much as a third of their harvest as rent. And in terms of tenure insecurities, in parts of um, northern Ghana, particularly in an area like Garut and Pani, where land is very scarce, we found out that tenure insecurity is so serious that from one year to the next, you might not have the same plot of land to farm on. And therefore, farmers are not able to develop the land on which they are farming because they have no way of knowing whether in the next harvest they will have access to that land. And as I said, I'm going to say, 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 i Kamibeyafuo Nothing much. And no first 
Ethiopia bunu bi mu ha sisi ya edin munya ni one be die wiase eduro no asase kura ya de ye ku ya djuma no asa asase ni ho e de se obi a so pese ne ba sua ngoma na obi a so ba ye uraba ene trachi asase asa se se asase se ye ye se ye wasu mura mpota mu ye se su mura ha ye wi se o so pe asase aye fu a e be ye de se obenya bi ai ba ko hara tanu nya tan be ha hasan ye kana oye suhana ka ngba to abe ko ha ole ko ko nya bela nti tangban pemma na wo ma na tangban kara nang da eh tin be yo ma pabo min daba tiza kwar me tin ye tin be ma so bidar polo so bidar tangban kwara de ku nya min ti anan anan shile ka yin zani chan te bo ayan ko shele nko pabo min daba za tiza kwar la yin domi tiza bu kwar yin ye wula ai ai ku gba tin gban ma ka pa gba mai ko no ko ko ayan gba la tin gban to gba ko gba ko the northern sector is not like Kumasi where the chiefs owe the lands. Here, you can be a chief and you don't owe any piece of land. We have the Tendanes, their land custodians. So when you have those people, you have to contact them. You have to go and contact them, sit down and dialogue with them. They can take something from you, but not so much. Nam Pokuta, the right to in a banana, no question what is it? A man and Nana Tanama Yunkuta, more for them, ne pass gain them, sad, not a city pazoo. But is it a cool summer? Then a catacool, Babylon to take a cool bed, can a catanaqua caracomale, then a canyango caranamala, then a knock of a city. Bendirguna, Tabuquan Zaha to make up from Dome Shab Dirka, Kagura, Kashami Dirpura. The Hagami Punulani, Shem Kuba and Dirmapura, Kashem Dirka Gura, then Chami Chamamani Chamabian. In commercial agriculture, irrespective of the model of commercialization, which could be a small or medium scale independent farm, contract farming, or large scale commercial agriculture, Actual production and marketing of crops depends on the relationships between farmers and domestic traders or aggregators, and more importantly, national and transnational agribusiness. Omo toku ko mani akua fo edin sa wo so da bia ton ko lo ma da ma da be fiel tete da ma man sa shinka fo ma sa na ko gba ko nye da bia ka bo kana da bo kala ara tira ni so de de ma tan mo so sa ti shinka fo ma ko pro bi ko sam sam le chan ka fa che ka so chan gba ka ka na za ka dulo ha ka ni tim to ni ko shinka fo ma za sa sa ni ma nyira ka ma ni ni ko ba yan dal ma da ka na da bi ma ka de yan da Approximately 35% of the cocoa produced in Ghana was processed locally into products such as cocoa butter and chocolate bars, as at the end of 2018, according to government cocoa agency CocoaBot. Generally, however, most of Ghana's cocoa and other cash crops are exported to the international market as raw materials. Policies and investment by both the public and private sector have favored the raw material cash crop export sector. With little attention paid to food crops, the domestic processing of cash crops, Mondelez is one of the largest manufacturers of chocolate bars and other confectionery in the world. It pays premiums to cocoa farmers in Asunafu, depending on the quantity and quality of their produce, and provides a number of incentives, 
which help farmers to deal with some of the challenges they face. These include the provisions of extension, inputs and credit through village savings and loans associations. The models we observed in our study areas were partly shaped by interactions and linkages between different organizations. So we have um, state agencies, non-government organizations, agribusinesses and farmer associations. So with, with respect to SNAFO, the model that we discussed about it was about a Mondelez and its operation in SNAFO. Mondelez, for instance, partners with Cocoa Board, which is a state agency um, with respect to extension services and also provision of input to farmers in, in, in the study area, that's in, in the SNAFO. Um, Mondelez also works with a number of um, non-governmental organizations such as World Vision and also Care International. These two organizations have, for instance, been involved in developing programs and plans for some of the participating communities of the Cocoa Life program, which is a program which has been implemented by Mondelez. The way our agricultural sector, especially the cocoa sub-sector, is structured, is structured in a manner that the farmers have to sell their cocoa beans to them the licensed buying companies or to the private companies. And the Ghanaian state is, you know, enjoys the monopoly of being the exporter of cocoa beans. Yeah. But what Mandela is that on the, way, on the world market is that because it is in charge of um, promoting agricultural production in the district that it's aware of, it's able to identify those areas and then it buys cocoa from those areas. Tony Kukunwo, Amanonia, and Fasoba Suntino, a drew me beer, ombre premium. Premium, a sika kakra, a daso on the brain. Almost a brain nuru. I did go in fuels. In Garu Tempani, sorghum production is receiving more attention because, in addition to its importance for food and local beer production, the Guinness Ghana Breweries Limited is now using sorghum to produce industrial beer. It has been estimated that up to 40% of the farmers in Garitampani who supply sorghum to the company are women. In Kwaibibrim, Surrender Palm Ghana Limited, a former NGO now converted into an agribusiness firm, provides oil palm producers with seedlings on credit in return for oil palm at prices determined by surrender palm. Farmers who enter into arrangements with the company face additional restriction. They cannot apply chemical fertilizers on their farms since their contract requires that they observe the principles of organic farming. The company's fair trade certification also prevents the use of children or pregnant women as labor. Serendipi Palm as, as an organization do not have um, a plantation on our own. We, we recruit and train smallholder farmers who do have their existing farm. What we do is just train them to do the organic and fair trade practices and also help them expand their own fields by procuring uh, improved uh, seedlings from certified sources for them. Serendipi Palm currently, uh, we do have uh, a demonstration field which uh, came about as a result of uh, the new planting system that we, we, we want to um, uh, introduce farmers to, which is called the dynamic agroforestry. Uh, this system combines different species of crops, cocoa, palm, citrus, mango, tree species and, and annual crops on the same piece of land. Hence, the farmer will be earning different uh, income from different sources of crops here yeah. and we believe that is the future of Serendipi Palm and future for farming for our smallholder farmers. By engaging in commercial agriculture, farmers hope to cater for their needs and support their families, but they face many difficulties in pursuing this goal. One of these is the problem of seasonal food shortages experienced in many farming communities across Ghana. 
some have raised concerns that uh, increasing commercialization may not always be positive so far as uh, smallholder farmer livelihoods are concerned. The reason simply is because you know these farmers also depend on their own production for food. So a farmer is, has uh, let's say five acres of land, he uses part of the land for cocoa production, part of the land for some cassava and maize or yam. Now if people fear that if you emphasize commercialization uh, too much, uh, farmers may devote all their resources to the production of non-food cash crops. So the farmer converts all the five acres of land to cocoa, for example. What it means then is that the farmer has to depend more on the market for their food. And if the markets do not uh, work well, if the markets fail, if food is expensive, then their food security could be compromised. So that's uh, one of the concerns that some raise uh, when it comes to commercialization. So, which means that commercialization could have uh, a positive or a negative effect depending on the particular situation. But in general, we find a positive effect, although some farmers have also raised issues of uh, seasonal food insecurity. So, what do you want to do with the people who are not going to do with the people who are not going to do with the people who are not going to do with the people who are not going to do with the people who are not going to do with the people into more no when you are brisa wood do as in Yama when you are cuckoo, no more no answer send a commercial air duo. Because only as I see be more or bedo I ediani. It's not for North Cassie. A ediani who are seven. You buy a face in a deer, not as I say no. Every nanny year don't you need you know, papa. In tea by year no more money board, dear no dear not a busso. Now later now could a fooling in a bay you could call. I am not a bianna who are yet. I can a pebre, and a Diane Hon Apache. In T. Winnie Musset, a pebby Siamma, comma bar, a brubby now, old dear cocoon with the firma, with the bishop attack. We will keep a sebaya and say, In T. Comba, Nigel, and we will boost you and we didn't crank a crack. And since we are not care move for the a more free, could work a seam at the Baha Beton Maya, and so eighteen my in a Diane. Credit. Equa be brim bombs was in. Say do tama, a Diana Hoya dinner. Omoya na omo brip be bripane, a fasse, a penifona, omo eti demono. Nem penifonas will go on soa, neba, are you queer? A to a nebanico for more brandy than anybody. Into any problem, ban penifona and the faces up with me or moa, or mine you queer. I'm more more mounswanya day, I'm to us. This is how we are refined, or if we are on cover, we are by science and the buyer is clear in thing. We have to be ready when anybody is ready. And now, what we are for now, we are for for now. We must be clear in thing. We must be ready when anybody is ready. And we must not be ready by science. Now, we are ready when anybody is ready. Because when we go to school, they better. We are ready to be ready. We are ready to be ready. Initially, we used to have six months hunger gap. I want to say today, probably in the north, the hunger gap is reduced. For about two months. Thank God today, at least each family, or most families, can boast of very square meals. I can am a young black woman who says she is a calm guy. The one more is Sanga Kanga Deep Naya. I can am here to pay a deep boy to pay a lot Sanga. The other part I can take you to see the decorala. Banjiru ko fear at. Tiri ko ko pa atano ko yan jira banjiru ko lala halen talang pa banjiru pa. In recent years, the right to food has been recognized as part of the package of approaches that hold the key to addressing the problem of hunger. In fact, the right to food and food security are closely related, as both concepts are concerned with availability, physical and economic access, nutrition, and the cultural acceptability of food. However, Achievement of the right to food is linked with the achievement of other human rights, and it could be a powerful approach to hold governments responsible for the elimination of hunger, especially for vulnerable people who have no systems of support. We may say from the outset that the Constitution does not expressly provide for 
um, the right to food. That is, you cannot get it word for word in the 1992 Constitution of the Republic of Ghana uh, about the right to food. However, we do have an indirect um, window, we do, we do have an indirect route on account of which a human rights claimant from the human rights constituency or whatever can make a claim in court for, for the right to food. And this indirect route is Article 33.5 of the Constitution. Article 33.5 um, says that rights, duties and obligations which are found in this Constitution shall not be deemed to exclude others that are not provided for. And those that are not provided for should be deemed to be inherent in a, a democracy and they should contribute to the dignity of man. So people can say that even though the right to food is not provided for, this is a window that you can go to court and say that the right to food is provided for because it is inherent in the, in the dignity of man. What's the dignity of man if you don't have food to eat? The, the three basic elements are mentioned in respect of the right to food. Availability of food, accessibility of food, and food adequacy. The food adequacy element we must emphasize has a cultural acceptance component. That is, you eat food that is culturally acceptable. For instance, peop some people, by virtue of geography and ethnicity, do not eat snails. Others, by virtue of um, geography and ethnicity, do not eat dogs. So even if you prepare for food, which is a Ghanaian, you know, tied with snails to somebody. He might not like it, even though that food is available. Accessibility, can you access it? Do you have economic power um, to access the food? You may find the food in the market, alone car, bags, but you don't have the money to buy, so you can't access it. Food insecurity cannot be resolved by simple or straightforward solutions. Rather, its complexity requires the adoption and implementation of a broad range of approaches strategies and actions. So to elaborate on the economic factors that affect um, women's food security and create differences, gender differences in, in food security, um, the first one has to do with inequalities in land holdings and access to productive resources. All over Ghana we find that um, women have inferior access to land. They tend to have smaller plots of land than, than men. They also have inferior access to labor and to other productive resources. Um, and this is connected with the fact that they have less money than, than men have. Secondly, we find that um, in terms of um, certain phenomena, such as the loss of common property resources, and this is becoming a big problem in a lot of farming communities because of the extensive commercialization of land and agriculture. We find that this has meant the loss of biodiversity and the loss of food diversity. And it is particularly hard on women because they have traditionally relied on these free sources of food to supplement um, the food security of their households. And thirdly, we find that in terms of agricultural commercialization, women's agricultural commercialization is often at a lower level than men, in that they produce at a smaller scale. And yet, paradoxically, we also found that women involved in commercial agriculture have better food security than women who, who are not, which shows that if women should be given the chance to engage in, in, in commercial agriculture and their problems solved, their households are likely to benefit from food security. In Ghana, the main government agency responsible for agricultural policy is the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, MUFA. And the Ministry carries out this role in close collaboration with the Ministry of Finance, the National Development Planning Commission, and Development Partners. The Ministry also have departments and agencies in the rural areas, in the um, districts and special regions. And these, are, these um, departments are supposed to hold consultative meetings with the local people so that their inputs can be made at the national level. We also have local and international NGOs as well as agribusinesses that have um, direct responsibilities for agricultural policies. Communities play a very integral role when it comes to district level policies. Communities have their own structures where they have assemblymen, assemblywomen, 
they have traditional authorities. For instance, in the area of community mobilization for infrastructure and development works, they come in handy as well when it comes to management of natural resources within their communities. There are so many actors in policy making. Um, there is issues of power, there is issues of negotiation, there's networking because most of these um, departments, um, development partners, most of the actors are actually pushing for their interest. And most of them are so powerful that they are in positions where they have access to decision makers, where they are financially resourced. And therefore, um, there's always that kind of negotiation and lobbying so that other people's interests could be put forth in policies. In spite of the numerous agricultural policies over the years, policy implementation is generally weak and ineffective. A study on Ghana's agriculture published by the World Bank in 2018 found that the sector only received 5.2% of total government spending between 2001 and 2014. This goes against the 2003 Maputo Declaration, in which African governments committed to allocating at least 10% of their national budgets to agriculture by 2008. For a long time, the budget allocation to the Ministry of Food and Agriculture has always been very low. In 2018, the Ministry requested for 1.8 billion Ghana cities, and unfortunately, they were given 598 million Ghana cities, and this represents just about 33% of what they requested. And these approved amounts are supposed to be reallocated to about 16 departments and agencies under the Ministry. Inadequate and delayed funds militate against successful implementation of government policies at the industry level. Um, if you talk to them, they will tell you that money is not just simply forthcoming. Sometimes you'll be in the third quarter and first quarter subvention will now be coming in. Additionally, policy implementation at the local level is dominated by agribusiness and NGOs and not the Ghanaian state. These non-state actors depending on their goals, have tended to pay more attention to certain crops and categories of farmers than to others. It is important that governments is able to owe and fund um, um, policies um, because government knows the kind of policies that would contribute to the development of the nation, that will contribute to poverty alleviation and also enhance the rural sector. So if they leave it for um, donors and development partners to take control, then they are going to do selective implementation of policies and that does not augur well for the nation. Apart from that, not much research is undertaken to inform policies. There is poor data. Um, for instance, in the country, we don't even know the number of farmers. We don't have gender disaggregated data to be able to inform policies that we are always um, formulating. Decentralization is fraught with some challenges of incomplete devolution, financial challenges, um, human resource challenges, and unequal participation um, at the district or municipal assembly level. If powers are decentralized to actors who are not accountable to um, their constituents and rather further they are accountable to the accounting and the appointing agency and not to the people at the grassroots, then this leads to um, incomplete devolution. Um, you have situations where DCs or MCs that are appointed feel that they are rather accountable to the appointing authority rather than the local people or their constituents. And when this happens, it leads to a lot of governance challenges. Currently, we are talking about extension farmer ratio of 1 is to 2,000. And these extension officers need to move in order to um, perform their duties and provide services to farmers because they are supposed to um, conduct dissemination services to farmers in terms of new technologies, in terms of research outcomes. And if they are not well resourced, it will be very difficult for them to reach out to farmers to be able to disseminate these new technologies for them to improve their situation. The desire of successive governments of Ghana has been to increase productivity of agriculture and economic growth, reduce poverty and improve food security and the conditions of workers. These goals cannot be achieved without serious attention to the problems of the agricultural sector. A transformed and vibrant agriculture is not only key to poverty alleviation and food security, 
but also national development. In the 1980s, where the World Bank and IMF policies prescribe state removal from the markets, now we see that institutions are very important and therefore it is important that institutions, especially in agriculture, are well resourced so that they can be able to perform efficiently. If agriculture has to be modernized, if it has to be a way of alleviating poverty, if it has to be a way of um, bribe states removal from the market. Now we see that institutions are very important and therefore it is important that institutions, especially in agriculture, are well resourced so that they can be able to perform efficiently. The last 30 years, um, the state has been discouraged from certain kinds of involvement in agriculture because of the belief that the private sector would deal with these matters better than the state would. I think our experience is suggesting that the private sector has not proved very capable or in some cases interested in solving some of the most serious problems of agriculture. And frankly, some of those issues are not the province of, of the private sector. So, so it's important to rethink how the state involves itself in agriculture to ensure that some of these persistent problems are addressed. Because only then can we have agriculture which is vibrant, and sustainable and also addresses the problem of food insecurity. There's a need to think more innovatively about how to make credit more accessible to farmers at a lower cost. Policy has to focus on how to educate farmers to use the right type of agrochemicals uh, so as to safeguard the environment and to, to protect themselves. Farmers are concerned about uh, the jobs of their children because they invest a lot of money in children's education and they expect to see some returns. Um, from, from that investment and so when unemployment levels are high particularly for the youth and for graduates it, it worries farmers also because they feel that their investments have not been worthwhile. In the 60s and 70s there were several cooperatives in Ghana and because of certain weaknesses that we saw in cooperatives, cooperatives were jettisoned as an important way in which farmers could come together and solve their problems. We need to take a second look at cooperatives and give them the needed support to ensure that they are robust enough and supportive enough to deal with some of the burning questions that farmers continue to face in, in agriculture. Averagely, people are increasing yields. But yields are also tied to population, and the food must reach the entire population. And because it must reach the entire population, it must move. And if it has to move, it means transportation must be cheaper to make food cheaper. Where I'm coming from is basically agriculture that we think will contribute to the total emancipation of the people, total liberation of the people from endemic poverty. And this calls for one development indicator, and that is motorable roads and irrigatable dams.